welcome to another episode of the Underground Bunker Podcast, special Danny Masterson retrial edition. This is your proprietor back in Los Angeles, and, uh, you know, we're already well into the trial, two weeks of testimony, and one of the people that joined us in the courtroom that I was really happy to see was Tori Chrisman. Tori! Uh, it was so nice to see you there at the court, and and we're sitting here together. We're not doing this online. That's so nice. I know. Tell yeah, me, tell tell me how it was for you going. You didn't go to the first trial, did you? No. So, uh, tell me about going to this trial and what that's been like for you. It was kind of. I was in the middle of some things for the first trial, so I couldn't. This one I could for a few days, and it was amazing for me. First of all, because I've been reading your reports for quite a while. And it's much different being in the courtroom than it is reading. As much as, I mean, it really made me appreciate how you write because it's, it's, it was quite confusing, some of the stuff. I mean, Cohen is doing a good job of confusing people, intentionally, I think. What I, what I try to do, just for the record, I'm not the court reporter. I'm not writing down everything everyone says. I'm, I'm writing as much as I can. But in some cases, I'm trying to um, get the gist of something. So, for example, Deputy DA Reinhold Mueller and Defense Attorney Cohen both do these big windups. Mueller will say, at some point in time, <laughs> in the past, you indicated that, and I just ignore all that. Right. And I just get to whatever his question is. And so you'll sometimes see very short questions like, what did he say? Well, you know, Mueller always says more than that. That's the thing. But I'm just trying to capture the essence of that and then doing my best to capture the really important things. But you, you've you now both been in the court and seen my transcript. Am right. I capturing it? You are capturing it. You are nailing it really in an excellent way in that it takes out the confusion. And you have to know, I was in... The courtroom with Scientology, when I was in Scientology, they had me in there. And I watched them do this kind of thing. And they intentionally do it. I didn't realize it at the time, but now I get it. It's like they're just trying to, you know, ask the same question over and over and over and over until someone, I think, till they cave in. That's what they're hoping. You know, they just get, in that, in that expression means they get up too upset. You know, they're just, you know, they just jerk them around until they're, they're very, very upset. And and this judge is so fantastic because I've she been great? with a bunch of different judges, but yeah. none of them have ever in the in the courtrooms I've been in nailed it like she is. Well, she let's is let's so just great. get some basics down because I, I'm always you know I'm always curious what other people think. First of all, do you think it's a large courtroom or a small one? Relatively small. It is relatively small, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It doesn't seem as big as you'd think it would be. Um, so Judge Omedo is up at the front, of course, and then. In the, uh, the attorneys. Then the attorneys are spread across a big, wide table. And then in the audience, on from where we are looking towards the judge, on our left is the Masterson group. They're kind of all by themselves. And then the public rows are nice, long rows. Right. And then right now, they're only allowing you to sit in two rows. And then the press, we're in the very back. Right. Um, and then, the, the, of course, the jury's off to the right. Did you... First, let's, let's go through Judge Olmedo. So you, you're impressed by her. Very impressed. I mean, A, she doesn't let Cohen, you know, just keep working her own. She'll say that question was asked and answered. Now, you can read that in your report, and it does say it, but it's very impressive in the courtroom. It's like, <laughs> wow. It's, it's just like pulling a card, you know, that's it. You know, and, and, and you can see for him, it, it's not good. Did you get to see any like real good battles between the two of them while you were there? Battles between the judge and between him? Judge and Cohen, yeah. Well, I yeah, I saw her where she'd say, That's it. You know, she would just call him. I don't know that it's a battle, but she, she nailed him on it. You know what I mean? And and he he really looked kind of bummed. You know, it's like that's his routine. And the other thing she did that I loved, because he's a big for people that haven't been in the courtroom, he's this big, kind of entertaining guy that you know, Waltz is back and forth, and ha and I'm putting my arms up above my head right now because that's what he does, right? You know, it's a real show, right? Right. And and it's entertaining. Right. But she said, you know what, Mr. Cohen, this is not an entertainment theater. This is a courtroom. 
So I'm going to give you the space that you can walk back and forth in. <laughs> and she said from the podium to the table, which is, what, five feet? There was an issue. But see, the, let me give you the background on that. That's actually an interesting thing you bring up because Cohen likes to pace when he's right. cross-examining. Right. He likes to walk back and forth. And the complaint he got from the witnesses was that if he's walking back and forth, at some point he's near Danny and the family. And these women don't want to look that direction. Oh. See? Oh, okay. And so he was asked, stay over by, oh, stop okay. pacing so, so that's far. that's why he was stay, in the middle. Yes, stay, like stay over stay by the, the lectern mm -hmm. so that the women don't have to look towards the okay. Mastersons. Yeah. yeah, that's a little backstory I didn't know. Yeah. Good, good. Well, that's even better. The, I've seen, there's been some uh, back and forth. I've tried to capture them between Judge Olmedo and Cohen this time. Nothing like the first trial. I mean, it got volcanic between the two of them. <laughs> <laughs> I assume we still have one of those coming up. But, uh, you know, I, I guess when he called for a mistrial the other day uh, about um, her limiting his cross-examination, they kind of got into it with each other. But still, uh, not, not too crazy. Tell me what you thought about the prosecutors, Reinhold Mueller and Ariel Anson. Did you get much of an impression about them? I think they're doing a very good job this time. I the last time I <clears throat> I read that you know I was trying to follow follow it, and um, I it was difficult the last time. This time it's much easier to follow. I think he's staying on course. I do think it's a little tricky because I do think Cohen is so much the entertainer. Right. I could see where I'm trying to watch it from the jury's eyes. Yes. And I could see where they'd be like, you know, kind of perked up because he's, it's just like anyone. Hey, you know what I mean? You're like, Oh, what? You know, whereas somebody's like, all right, now we're going to tell you the next thing. You know, it's sort of like, it just, it, it's tricky. It is tricky. So I think he's staying the course and he's making the points that are correct. But I do think if he was a little bit livelier, it would help. And today, um, gosh, I was hoping you'd come. This We're recording this on a Thursday, and I wish you'd been there today, because Ariel Anson did the questioning today of Jane Doe 2. She did a very, very good job. I read that, yeah. I, I, I think uh, not only is Mueller doing a better job putting together a narrative this sure. time, yeah. I think it's smart that they're sharing duties a little bit more this time, and Ariel Anson is getting to question, because she's, she's very good. That's the thing that I wrote on your blog today that I don't know that you had time to see, but I, my grandfather was a doctor and a fabulous storyteller, right? He loved to tell stories and he had a great way of pro projecting an image so that it, I mean, he was really into scary things. So it used to scare us to death, right? Like he told us his, his teacher was eaten by wolves and stuff. He, he grew up in North, North Dakota, yeah. So anyway, but he loved to tell stories and he was very good at it. And I think it's a very good thing for even in a courtroom because then the jury can stick with you. It stays interesting. Do you see what I mean? Where, <clears throat> whereas if it's just the facts, which it kind of has to be because they want it to be just the facts. So it's tricky, but I think that would help. And um, you got to see Jane Doe 1. Um, how, how did she hold up? I mean, you saw, did you see direct testimony or just cross-examination? I can't remember which days. I saw direct and uh, just a little bit of cross. But the direct, I thought she was, she did a marvelous job. I mean, it, it's it's a very, very, very painful thing to go through. And and she's had to go through it a few times. This is the third time. I know. Right. You know, so it, it's like, you know, for Scientologists listening, they had the, is it erasing or going more solid? Well, believe me, with this kind of thing, I don't think it's erasing ever. You know what I mean? It's, it's so painful. It's just one of those things where you could feel it from her. And I thought she did a great job of communicating the truth about it. Do you know what I mean? Right. Of course, Cohen tried to, you know, take up these nitpicky questions. It was like, who cares? You know, did you... Did you have your underwear on the right or the left? You know, I mean, he didn't say that, but I'm just saying it was just something where it was just nothing. You know, and people were like, all right, get to the rape. Well, like, well, like with her in particular, uh, he kept asking her about the temperature of the water in the jacuzzi. That's what I'm saying. That's what and, I'm saying. And she, I couldn't understand, it's called impeaching when the, what the defense 
attorney's trying to do is that you know you said something was blue, but then right. he gets you to and admit later they that it was somebody you. else, and you're wrong. Right. That's called impeaching. He was trying to impeach her, and I I, I didn't quite get because she had said something like it wasn't it wasn't that it was cold. It was a warm jacuzzi. But it was a cold night, and she knew when you get out of the jacuzzi on a cold night, the water, you're going to be wet, you're going to be cold. Right. And I, But that's as much as she said. And then he was trying, I don't know, had she said that it was real hot in a previous interview? He never made it clear what he was trying to do with no. that. It just seemed like such a waste of time. And that's one of the things Judge Olmedo brought up when she was limiting him. Good. Say, you know, if you, know, if, if you wanted to ask her about you know, this other thing, why'd you spend so much time on the jacuzzi? Right. Water? Right. <laughs> and, and there is so much time. People have to keep that in mind. There's so much time for each thing. It's yeah. Well, yeah, well, they, he, he got a lot of time, but he was getting more time in the prosecution. So, so that was, he, you know, he asked for a mistrial on that, that, that she cut, you know, she limited him. Thank God. But, uh, yeah. And, um, so that's, Okay, so that's the, the, the witnesses you saw, the, the judge, the, and then what about the jury? Do you have any impression about the jury at all? It's very tricky to, to watch them. Uh, they seem like they're paying attention, except for a couple of them that have fallen asleep a couple of times. But um, overall, they seem like they're paying attention and I think interested, but it's just a guess. They don't look bored. They don't, to me. They don't look like they're... You know, kind of, oh, God, we have to keep listening to this. Right. Something. Even right. with he asking the same repetitive questions. That's why I think it's fabulous. Well, that's because the police haven't come yet. Once the police get, they'll get good and bored. <laughs> um, I have a breakdown. Um, let's see. I, I, I just said younger and older so that I, I'm judging the younger folks. You know, it's the people that are between 25 and 45 and older being... Um, those that are older than that. So let's see, three, four. So it looks to me like it's seven younger to five older. It's seven women to five men. I counted one, two, three, four, five Latinos or Latinas. And I counted uh, two black people. So, um, you know, I, I would say it, it's... It's very representative of L.A., it seems is. to me. Yes. And, uh, and I, I, I can't look at them too much, Tori, because I'm typing no. so much. But whenever I have looked over there, they seemed pretty interesting. That's what I'm saying. They're, they're paying attention, and they're, they're many different ages. And I, yeah. uh, you know, that's all we can ask at this point. We don't know what they're thinking yet, yeah. just as long as they're paying attention and consider all the evidence. So right. that's interesting. Okay, what about the Masterson side? Now, you know some of these people. I know them. I ta- I've known Danny since he was two. I wow. taught him in s- sixth grade. And I've watched him kind of evolve from a, a kind of a darling person into not... And this is, not, this is true of more than one person at Celebrity Center. So it's not just him. I mean, he, it's just him as far as these rapes. But as far as the, these kids evolving into kind of creepy, you know, we're better than you, get away. You know, it was like, what is this? Yvonne Jens, who started Celebrity Center, would never, ever have had that kind of thing in there. Never. Not ever. I mean, she, I, I watched her with people that were just Joe Nobody. And she was leaving with a huge crew of people to go to Mexico. And she, they're all barreling out the door. And this young kid runs out and he goes, Yvonne, I just finished my course. And she goes, okay, everybody stand back. And they all set down their luggage. And she goes, what do you have to say? And he goes, I just had the greatest win, blah, tell me your win, blah, blah, blah. And she goes, that's fabulous, darling. And she goes, so what's your next course? And he said, this thing. And she said, okay, I'll see you when we get back. But see, that's, that was the person who started Celebrity Center years and years ago. And, and it was a... 1969? It was a very... Well, I was in... It started, I think, in 71 or 72. But I got in 69. But, um, but she... She was very amazing, you know, and, and, and people, it's, it's sad for people that, you know, sometimes we should do an interview of, with some people that were there then compared to now, because we talk about it and go, oh my God, it's just such a different thing. And pe- many, many people that are on your blog, they have no clue that at one day 
Ish was a fun place to be. No, it, I've, it heard that, cool I've heard that. I've heard that. I've heard that from many former Scientologists that when they got in in the sixties and seventies, it was a different kind of a thing. It was more fun. It was, just say if it isn't fun, it's not Scientology. Right. That was our quote. Right. You can't say that now. No way. Well, what do you, what do you think about the picture of Scientology that is emerging in this trial, as far as the things that Jane Doe's have said? and what Claire Headley said uh, this week. Well, I think Claire helped clar- clarify some of the Scientology, you know, references and why it's important that these young ladies were so young and in Scientology and per the policy, you know, she really, I think, explained how it, they, they can't call the police. They can't. It's not like... They didn't, or they were lazy, or something like that. They can't. They'll lose every friend, their family, you know, everything, if they do. I mean, it's hard for a, a regular person to imagine that that could be true. And I, it happened to me yesterday. I told, Today it happened. I went to a guy for my ear, nose, and throat thing, and I was telling him a little bit about it, and he kind of gave me that look like, oh, God, you're nuts. And I said, don't do it. Don't even start with me on that, you know, because we were already having fun. And I said, look, that is a common thing that people think, that people in cults are just stupid. And I said, but top academics came and studied me when I left. And they said, Tori, you're the first happy person we've ever seen leave a cult, ever. (laughs) And and they wanted to know what happened. Anyway, that's a whole different story. But, But the point is... They, their main point to me was, look, a lot of people say people in cults are stupid. He said, nothing could be farther from the truth. These are two, two different academics. And they said, most people that get into cults have high IQs. That's why they got in the cults. They wanted to do something more, something different. I guess, I guess the, the point I was getting at is you just told me that there was a time when people were joining Scientology because it was fun. But what I'm saying is the picture that's emerging in the testimony in this trial is an organization that's controlling, that is, uh, you know, heavy on punishing and making victims believe. It's totally that, vile. It's awful. I mean, it's nothing to do with what I was talking about. Nothing. I mean, I, I feel for these women because they don't have any backup. Any. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's... it's I. It's just awful that they're in this organization and surrounded, like the Mastersons, I look at them, like you say, I've known them. And to see Danny, and he's just kind of sitting there, you know, just like, okay, whatever. You know, and I, I know what he's thinking. I didn't do it. You know, it, it, they can't, you know, prove this on me. I, I'm off, I'm free, that's it. And he's just got his plexiglass down. He's not really hearing anything that anybody's saying. So it's not really affecting him. The one person in the Mastersons that is being affected is Carol Masterson. His mother. And someone po- his mother. And someone pointed out to me the other day, because I mentioned this to a friend that when we all know the Mastersons, and she, and she said, this was on the phone, she said, you know what? The difference is all those kids, because you know there's a bunch of kids, the brothers and sisters, the brothers and you know, different family members and stuff like that. They all were born in Scientology. They don't have a concept of what it's like to not, to be able to call the police. Do you see what I mean? But Carol does. Mm. She wasn't, she wasn't born in Scientology. And I think it's very heavy for her. I have watched her through just, it was just two days, but the whole two days, she was very, very serious and not a happy camper. Well, her, her son's on prison, for, I know. On, on trial for his life. I know, but most Scientologists, I'm telling you, they can go, oh yeah, you know, no big deal. Um, and, uh, and you knew her. Yeah. And, and you had some sort of interaction with her at the courthouse of some sort? All that happened was I just tapped her. I was honestly just going to say hi. That was all. This was in the hallway? No, it was in the courtroom. <laughs> I didn't realize I can't do that. You know, I, I really didn't know that. I didn't, you know, no one had ever told me that. I've been in a lot of courtrooms. But anyway, it, she had a really bad reaction and looked at me and gave me a really dirty look. And I was like, okay, I get it. You know, that, there you go. Yeah. I won't tell you how. Right. Um, yeah, today was, uh, today, Thursday, was a, a real small crew. It was just Carol, Bijou, his wife, and then... Um, 
Jordan, his brother, Alana, his sister, uh, and I think, uh, was Christopher there? Yes, but, you know, smaller, only about half the normal crew. And um, also the audience was really uh, sparse. And, and only three reporters, um, uh, your faithful proprietor and uh, channel <laughs> ABC7 and the LA Times. LA Times was there. And they're, they're not right. always there. but. Right. But yeah, it, it's. Uh, hey, good morning, I think America people. There, I think people wanted to get out of town before the four day weekend. But anyway, um, so but the other thing I want to just describe on the Mastersons is that they are behind the bailiff, right? So they right. really only have. My description is they have like a quarter of the courtroom, right? And all the rest, as the judges pointed out, it is a public courtroom, so anyone can sit in those chairs. That's right. Um, and some days it's a little more full than others. Uh, it's been, it's actually been full a couple days, a couple days this week, but today, no. Um, and, uh, yeah, so let's talk about Claire a little bit more. See, I, I thought it was interesting that she could, they told her ahead of time, you can't talk about escaping. I know. Did you see, I put that, did you, I put that in the, no, what did you say? Uh, in your blog. What did you say? I, I said, I, as long as I've left, I'm the person that, that I know that started saying I escaped out because I did. You know, yeah. they chased me across the country. Right. And so I started saying escaping. And then all of a sudden now everyone's escaping, right? And so now they say you can't say escape. So I, now I'm on your blog and I say for the first time in 22 years, I say, well, because I think, oh, you can't say escape. And so I say, um, well, I departed in, 20, in July, 20, to, July 2000. And I thought, you know what? Screw that. And I put in parentheses, I escaped. <laughs> and they chased me across the country in the Tampa police and, and some new friends got me out of the Tampa airport. That's what happened. That's a fact. And it's on the internet. It, you know, anybody can see it. You know, if you go back in time, it's all recorded. So there you I go. I wrote that story in 2001. I know. <laughs> I know. Tony Ortega. That was a lot of fun. Yes. But no, they told her she couldn't talk about escaping. They didn't want her to talk about her own experiences. Uh, of course, she right. could she could talk about Scientology for hours if they would just let her. But they they wanted her just to basically define some of these terms that the the witnesses, the victims, had been using. Which is key. Yeah, it's very. Key. Yeah, and I thought she did a great job. Yeah, I thought she did a great job. I really did, and I think it's very important for the the jurors so that they can hopefully. Understand. I mean, it's a very weird thing to understand. It, it is. is. It is. It it really is. And 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 it, and you, when we're just talking about the words, you know, then you add in the mind control, you know, which is a whole different issue. That's that's not coming up at all. Yeah, I mean, you know, each one of them. I know Jane Doe two who went today doesn't have as extensive a Scientology history as the others, but even today she was talking about how. Total, you know that that the indoctrination is of the way you think about things, right? And so she had had a previous incident with another man. She went to the church with it and went through the same thing, where she was made to feel that she's the one causing the problem. And and so you know, of course. why would she go back once Danny did what he did? So yeah. you know, so even so, all three of these women went through that where the church made them feel like. Being a victim was something wrong. Oh, yeah. I was locked. I mean, you know, I was locked on the base. They wouldn't let me off the base. And, and it was like they had done something wrong, but they locked me on the base and they wouldn't let me go. And, and it, was, it was insane. I mean, I, I, it was like they, they promised they would pay me $500 if I was on staff here in L.A., and then I finally got to my six month check, and I said, I can't live on five hundred, you know, on fifty dollars a, a, a month. It's not working. I can't do this. So they put me in liability. Boom. That, you know, that's what happens with these girls. It's like boom, you're trash. Okay, so work out of trash. And it's like so you have to do it. You know, they're not going to let me go off of the flag land base in Clearwater. I got to get home to my kid and my husband. Okay, so I finally, you know, work out of the condition. Now I say, look, just let me go back to L.A. and I'll work, I'll do the amends where you have to make up the damage in L.A. where I, where I did this horrible deed of leaving staff, right? No, you got to do it here. So I had to find someone from L.A. that was there training and train her 
And then I had to get signatures from the place in L.A. And I had to get my son to go around L.A. org and try to get signatures. And you know what? The, norm, normally with these kind of thing, everyone will sign. They would not sign. They wrote all these shitty things about me. It was awful. And anyway, we finally, I had to pay money, which is against policy. I had to pay money to her so she could buy these stupid pins for the staff. And then at, at two in the morning, my friend who's from Australia said, God damn it, Tori, we're going to get this thing so you can get out of here. And she dove over the reception because everybody was asleep. And she dove over the reception. The fax thing came out. She said, okay, you're done. Get out. You know, and I, but it's just unbelievable, yeah, the stuff crazy, they pull. Crazy. So you, I can't even imagine what these women. And like they've said, Jane Doe One mentioned, they have to worry about what they're also going to do to them on the back end. Do you see what I mean? It's like, okay, Danny raped him, and that was awful in itself. But then there's the Church of Scientology and all their little bigger game. You can lie, cheat, steal, destroy someone utterly. That's their policy, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, these women, like one of them said, you know, we, yeah. Oh, oh, the husband. I love that. He said, yeah, I need money. I need money for my kids to get therapy for this stuff. He's not kidding. Right. You know what I mean? And right. I need security for the rest of my life. Yeah. He's right. Yeah. You know, and, and this is a church that get, gets by with nonprofit status. It really ticks me off. It's crazy. It really does. It, and I've been speaking out for a long time about it, but it's like, when will this government wake up and go, you know what? No. These are civil crimes. Do you see what I mean? They're, they're criminal and they're also civil crimes. There's, well, there's civil rights abuses. There's also a civil trial going on. And uh, uh, it's, you know, Judge Omedo in the first trial really did her, both, her best to keep them completely separate. But this time she's allowing in some of those claims from the civil trial, hacking right. and, and, and harassment Good. and things like that. Good. Which is which is interesting. And that'll help. Don't uh, you think? Well, we'll see. I mean, it's hard to know with this jury, but it's true, it's hard to know, you know, because it, it's really hard to know. But I I think Claire is a person that, besides being extremely knowledgeable, which she is, she also is very likable. Yes. So that helps. And the other thing I wanted to point out with her, because they're already trying to, you know the expression, dead agent her. Right. Right? Oh, she only did OT4. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's what I wrote on your blog today. I said, here's the deal. Scientology is like a triangle, right? The right side is training. The left side is policy. And way, way at the top, think of the top of a triangle, that's where you hear about the top secret stuff. No, the, all the rest of the people in Scientology know nothing about it. They don't hear it. They don't know it. Nothing. So OT, if you do OT3 and above, you know all this stuff. So she's just as gender, and she may not have done the actual level, but I did. I did up to OT7. But I think the point she was trying to make is that she had so much management experience. Exactly. That's, that's unrelated to... OT levels. But that's what I was trying to say. It's like there's the triangle yeah. and the top of the triangle, and then Claire is above that with the management. Right. Uh, speaking of likable, another person that was there the same day you were was Leah Remini. Leah has come, I think, three days, um, and she didn't she didn't come to the first trial. So it's great to see her in the courtroom. She was there on uh, the first day of op opening statements. And she's been there. She was there a couple of days as Jane Doe One support person. Right. Uh, the defense made a big deal about it and tried to get her excluded by saying they were <laughs> going to call her as a witness. And I believe they've subpoenaed her. Um, but Judge Almeida said no, she can stay. Um, you were there at least one day at the same time as as Leah. Did you get to interact with her? I, I did. Yeah. It was just it was quick because you know it's lunch. Lunch is very short. Right. But we did, and and you know I I I like Leah. She's a good person. It was great to see her there in the courtroom, yeah. and it was really great to see the defense freak out about it. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. They're so funny because they're almost like, to people that are listening, it's like they're almost over in a corner, right? Doesn't it sort of feel that way? At least it does to me. You know, they look like they're over, because they're behind the bailiff, right by the front door when you walk in. Right. But then the rest of the courtroom is all the... You know, us and other people and the journalists and stuff like that. So, right. 
Well, Tori, you, you actually have uh, history with Scientology in the courts going back a ways. <laughs> I love I'm your stories right. about the tell us Tell us a fun story about you and Scientology uh, litigation or trials. Uh, you know, there, they, I, there's so many. It's, it's one of them that I don't think I've told you. Did I tell you about the David Mayo one? I don't think so. Okay, so David Mayo was... They had decided, you know, it was originally, you know, like everyone, you know, the top of the triangle, really great, you know, international, you know, CS and stuff like that. Anyway, which is like over all the cases and stuff like that. Great guy. Anyway, then they um, decided he was a suppressive person. Hubbard did. And so now there's a the big trial with uh, the people that are out of Scientology and I was on the side with with um, okay. Let me just clarify. So David Mayo was at one time basically the highest technical person right. in Scientology under right. Hubbard, right. and had actually written some of the highest levels right. knots and stuff. Right. right. So uh, he's from New Zealand, I think originally, and then he had been kicked out basically, and so he started an independent. Oh, that's right. Scientology thing called right. the Advanced. Um, yeah, it's something. He was uh, up it, in it, Santa Barbara. Yeah, it was in Santa Barbara and uh, Advanced Ability Center, right? right. AAC, right. And so then Scientology sued him for for basically ste- you know, stealing their material, right? right? Wasn't that what it was about? Yeah. So there was an actual trial. And and so there were, you know, David Mayo supporters going to the courthouse and Scientologists. Is that the setup? Yeah, and I would yeah, and I was on the other side. I was with Scientology, but for me it was I have to say, and it was years ago, but it was kind of a wake-up call for me because it was very weird to see what was going on. And and it was like, they start out, they go, you know, David Mayo, have you ever, you know, promote, promoted that you have the Knott's materials, which is the top secret stuff? And he said, uh, no. And they said, okay. And they wheel in this huge television set. And they said, we'd like to show this video and he's like welcome to the AAC you know this is you know we've got the whole bridge from the beginning to the top and they go thank you very much you know and they just kind of one thing after another asked him a question and then they'd show it wasn't what he said so it sounded like Scientology was winning okay and at the end and it was all it's, it, it all kept coming down because this was before and you were there as like an audience member or what, what was no, your role I was there like I, I had helped also with some other things yeah weren't you spying on people no, I wasn't spying. I was never spying on people. I wasn't. I never did. I handled the guy at Richard Tenney, who was the city commissioner for Clearwater. And I had a two year, a little baby son. And they called me and we just moved there. And they said, you need to handle this. And they had, you know, mobs of people. It was like, you know, it was, I'd never seen anything like it. It was like Save Sparkling Clearwater, Stamp Out Scientology, Honk Out Scientology, all this stuff. And this guy, Milt Wolf, said, you need to handle it. And I said, me? I'm a mother. I have a baby. And he goes, I don't care. You're, there's only four of you here. And we lied. We lied when we came to Clearwater. So that's why you have to handle it. Because his big pitch is Scientologists or liars don't trust him. So he said, so we can't go out and handle it. So you have to handle it. So I did. I walked up to this old grandmother and she was holding this American flag and the thing against Scientology. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm against Scientology, this and that. And I said, no, look, look at the product. This is a real product. My son's crying. That's what you're doing. That's all you're doing. Nothing else. Get out of here. Go home. Put down your flags. You know what I mean? I was, I was pissed. Tori, was like I'm my... sure you were the most effective Scientology warrior of all time. <laughs> so f- tell me what happened with David Mayo. You left me hanging okay, down in the okay, court okay. case. So, Mayo, so I forgot how I got off of that. You asked me something and the guy got off into it. But um, anyway, with Mayo, okay, so it's, it's very tricky because they keep asking him questions. And Zenu had not come out. The big Zenu, that is top secret thing, that no one had heard that word. And so the, apparently this one, the judge had a box. This was the box. early 80s, right? Yeah. And the judge had a box with the top secret information in it. Mm. But she couldn't look at it. It was all blacked out, right? And so anyway, finally, it keeps coming up, you know, were there cop? Did you have copies of the OT three material? No. Did did? Oh yes, I did. Okay. Were there holes in the copy? Yes. And so I'm like, okay, what's the deal with these holes? I remember going out at a break and asking someone I knew. I said, what's the deal with these holes? They keep asking every person. Did you have copies? Did you have holes in it? 
And it ended up, it was a guy in Hawaii had copied the top secret information. And he, in his copy machine, he had these hole punch things. Oh. So every one of those copies That's was from That's how they knew where him. the copies came from. Yeah, so I that see. was the end. So Scientology, of course, said, at the end, that judge said, okay, I can see there's a lot of, you know, big, you know, like the, the what do you call them, you know, status between the two of you. You know, you've got your big, or, what are they, the, what do you call those things that are on, you know, a, a Navy guy and he's got the things on the sides. Yeah, the yeah insignia basically yeah. Yeah, anyway, showing rank. Showing that rank, right? And she said, "I can see there's a lot of rank here on both sides. So I want you, David Mayo, and Ray Midoff, who I think now is on the in the um, he's in the hole now. He's in the hole now. But at the time, he was the top dog. And I want you to go in that room and decide how much money, you know, someone has to pay if you know blah blah blah, and settle the thing and settle it and come out." And so Scientology told me, which is typical of Scientology, they just lied through their teeth and said, we won. Mm -hmm. And it was hard for me to tell. It was hard to see who told, because they went in there and then they came out. Right. And they were like, we won. And I found out years later, they didn't win. Mm. She, you know, it was, it, it was David Mayo won. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And then, weren't you... Uh, and I have a, five, a six page letter, a handwritten letter from David Mayo that sometime I'll show you, because he... It was a whole different story. But anyway, I, it was really fun. Well, I used to talk to him. Huh? I used to talk yeah, to him. Yeah, yeah. We, we used to Me too. He called me because I, I heard he was on one of the chat things. And I said, is this really David Mayo? And he, I said, call me if it really well, is. He used and to he call did. me up from New Zealand and we would wow. talk. Yeah, it was great. I really liked him. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Wollershine. Tell me about your involvement in that case. Okay. Um, that was a thing where I knew Larry Wollershine. And just because of that, I wanted to be in the courtroom. And they had flocked people down to the courthouse downtown. I mean, if you think there's people here, I mean, there were hundreds and hundreds of people there picketing outside and not one thin dime for a wall or shine. And they gave dimes out to everybody and we had to wear them, which was a pin, a dime, that he didn't get a dime, right? Right. <laughs> So anyway, I said to my, to my friend at the time, Bill Yachty, I said, look, get me in here somehow, some way. Because they had to be OT7s. They could only be OT7s. Because of OT7s, can intention can intend things, right? But of course, they can't do shit. You know, that's the truth. But they think they can. And so they had to have all OT7s in there. So I said to Yachty, come on, get me in there. I, I know Wallershire. I'll figure out what to do. So I get in there. Now I'm in the courtroom. And... I figured I got to do something to be valuable. So I numbered all of the jurors. This is just me thinking this up. Sure, this wasn't somebody sure. saying to do it. Yeah. I thought it up myself. I right. thought, all right, I'm numbering the juries. And then, and then I numbered the attorneys. And then every time they'd ask a question, I'd go all the way down the line. You know, so he's shaking his head yes. He's shaking what his the head jurors no. are doing. Yeah, you know, this guy's sleeping. You know, after a while, this, these two girls are playing tic-tac-toe all day. You know, that kind of stuff. I right. had, it was an ongoing thing. And I came out that day. And these guys said, we're investigation. And I said, okay. And they said, give us your notes. And I said, okay. And I gave them the notes and they came back and they said, okay, we want you in there every day. Doing the same thing. <laughs> doing the same thing. Of course, it obviously didn't help because Wallersheim won. Right. So, <laughs> so Lawrence Wallersheim was a Scientologist who had been in since the 60s, I think. 69, I think. And he sued... Uh, I think in 79 or something like Probably that. And it took that. quite a while before yeah. it got to go. And then there was a trial in like 84 or something like yeah. that. But what's significant about his case, uh, 84, 85, and there was another one in Portland going on right about the same time. Which I was what, there too. We, what's Chris so Hoffman. significant about those two cases is that these were two former Scientologists not suing because they were in the Sea Org and they were abused or they were trafficked. They were suing because Scientology harmed them. Right. Scientology itself, the auditing, the courses, this is what made it so alarming for Scientology. And in both cases, you had juries award them about $30 million each. And punitive. It was just... It was $25 million stunning, and punitive. Stunning. Yeah. And um, so that's what it was so significant about that. And then also that Wallersheim, as part of his case... Uh, had all these upper level materials ad admitted as exhibits, right. and then the LA Times and the, the, the 
Scientologists pulled this trick. I don't know if you were involved in this. I was in a where one day. Where they would line up at the court right. clerk's office right. and take turns checking it out we had, to it, keep it out of the hands of the reporters. Yeah, see, if you, if you check out the materials early enough, then the reporters can't get to it. And they were terrified they would find out about Xenu. So they had people go down there every day for months and check out the material and sit on it for eight hours the whole day. Yeah, right. sit on the and box. then one day, I did it one day, and I said, "I'm done. I'm not." Right, doing and then one day, a Los Angeles Times reporter got in there early yeah. enough, or whatever, and got right. it, and they published stories about Zenu. But I always want to point out that the actual first person to mention Zenu in print, who was not in the church, obviously, was um, uh, was Robert Kaufman in 1972. Dory. Whoa. Oh, wow. Yes, yes. He In wrote a, print? Yes, he wrote a book called Inside Scientology. He was this British guy. He had been to uh, the upper level stuff in Edinburgh, I think. Oh. And um, he wrote, oh, he may not have been a British guy, but anyway, he wrote, <laughs> He he's the first one that revealed wow. the upper level. But see, it was a book nobody saw. Right. Nobody saw the book. No, You know, it wasn't published widely in papers or anything. Right. So the next person, I believe, was Richard Leiby in the Clearwater Sun in like 1980. Right. So, the, but of course it was the LA Times in the Wallersheim case that really got it wide. Right. That was the one everyone remembers was that they got the filings out of the case, they published it, and that's what really spread that name right. far and wide. Right. And then of course ultimately the one that reached the millions of people was South Park in 2005. Right, 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 right. You got, I love this kind of history. But. I know, it's kind of amazing. This is another thing with the Wallersheim trial. During it, the, pro, the, the judge had said he would not let in um, any OT materials into the courtroom. And Wallersheim was starting to... And, and a bunch of the top, top executives, I think Ms. Scavis was there and his crew, and they were all there, and Ken Houghton was the president of the church. And Ken said to me, look, whatever happens, you handle it in the courtroom. And I said, okay, you know, that, that's me, you know, right? I, I'm just, okay, I'll do it. And having no idea what she's talking, or he was talking about. So now, Wallerstein starts rolling into dreams that he had. And I thought, uh-oh, he's going to roll right into Zeno. This is going to happen. And the execs are all there. And I'm thinking, oh, no. And, and Ken Hogan leaves it to me to handle it, right? And so I finally just jumped up. And, and From the audience. I had already jumped up once before. So the, the judge kind of knew me. Kind of knew who you I, were. Yeah, okay. and I, I said something before. So now I jump up and Wallersheim's attorney goes, she can't talk. She can't talk. Right. And, he, and the judge goes like that. Sit down. And I think, oh, God, he's talking to me. And I don't faint. I really don't. But I almost fainted. And because and I, I thought he was talking to me. Right. And he, goes, he looks at him and he goes, Mr. So-and-so, I can't remember his name, but the attorney, you sit down. She might have something important to say. I'm right behind him. So it was like he's pointing at both of us. Right, right. right. So then we, you know, he sits down. I'm standing there. He says to the jury, everybody out. I need all the jurors out of the courtroom. And he goes, all right, what do you have to say? And I say... Um, Cooley, that's what I'm thinking of. Mr. Cooley was Scientology. Scientology attorney was Earl Cooley, right? right. Earl Cooley. And uh, I say, look, you promised that you weren't going to let the OT3 materials into the courtroom, and uh, he's kind of getting into it now. And he looks at me, and he goes, well, then why isn't Mr. Cooley saying anything? And again, I don't faint. Right. But I'm telling you, I was very close to fainting. Sure. It was just like, oh, my God. And then I have to go conk, you know, like a, a metal head thing against my head. Get it together. Think. You were keeping your TRs in, right. Dory. No, I wasn't. It oh. wasn't my TRs. It was just me. <laughs> okay. you know? and, and I would think. And, and, and so I thought about it. And I thought, okay, let's get something straight here. I am OT3. Mr. Cooley has never done OT3. So there lies the difference. Mm. And all the executives start jumping up. I'm OT3. I'm OT3. I'm OT3. Wow. And, and Yachty came over to my house that night because he was in the back doing all the admin stuff. And he handed me this huge packet. And he goes, here's your OT8. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, you have to do a big contribution to get onto OT8. And this is your OT8. Wow. 
you know, it's just sort of, it's all weird to people that, you know, are against Scientology. I get it. But when you're in the show, you have to remember I was in the show. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. at that point, it was like kind of a, an interesting thing that happened. But, you know, you can see why they hate me. Because <laughs> <laughs> they, they really thought I was under their thumb. And I was for a long time. I really was. I was a real true believer. But guess what? I woke up. Well, we're all the better for it. Tori. I know. Everybody is. Everyone who wakes up. Every single person. And you know what? You never know when the next person's going to wake up yeah. and leave. Yeah. And these women are so fantastic saying their stories. I mean, I just... Oh, it's it's so courageous of them to say to say what they're saying and go through it. And, and to have this guy be such a creep. You know, it's just offensive to me. But anyway, I think they're going to win. I hope. Well, I you know, I, I'm, I'm staying out of that handicapping business this time because I, I really felt like they were doing a great job last time. And I talked to journalists on, on who said that they were. Prosecution was doing fine last time. I talked to other journalists who felt they weren't. I don't know that anybody predicted a mistrial last time. Um, so I don't know. It's 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 a tough look at it. You know, these kind of cases are tough. It's tough with or without the Scientology component. Yeah. But at least they're getting to dig into that a lot more. This I, time. Know. I know. We're hearing some amazing stuff. Yes. That, you know, you just don't hear about Scientology ever. Yeah. And uh, and it's a shame that it's just not more press coverage. I mean, I'm doing my best. At least, you know, we got the we're getting the the. The statements out. I mean, my notes should help. I've already seen one other journalist clearly using my notes to tell a story. That's that's good. That's what I want. Good. I want other journalists to use that sure. material. Sure. And I'm glad that they do. And, and yeah. you know, I, I do hear some very nice things from other journalists about it that uh, they appreciate that that they're getting those full notes. It's so, and you make it so clear. It's really understandable. And it's they're they're really trying to make it ununderstandable. Yeah. Cohen does his best to kind of confuse everybody, doesn't he? Yeah. So anyway, that's that's my take on it. I, I thank everyone that's involved, certainly you. I mean, you're you know, you're just my hero. You are Oh Tori. You are. You are. You're a great guy. You work hard. I don't think people realize how hard you work. And it's just amazing to see in person. It really is. You know, it's one thing to be at home in your house and you're reading your notes and stuff like that and maybe doing other stuff, petting your dog, whatever, you know, being busy, you know, cooking or something. But but it's it's a whole other thing to be in the courtroom and see you. I mean, I, I can't believe, first of all, how fast you can type. I can't. I mean, you're and, and you like railroad type from eight or nine in the morning all the way to like four. Yeah. You know, you really, I mean, you might take a break at lunch, but I think you do the, your lunch break thing. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the way this developed was, okay, I knew there were going to be no cameras in the courtroom. Last time I got here and I, you know, they, I wanted to make sure I had a seat. Right. And they had put out a media advisory saying, if, you, if you're a reporter and you want in, you got to put your name on this list. Oh, and by the way, anybody want to be a pool reporter? And I had just signed up for that, Tori, because I always figure in those kind of things, you sign up for everything, right. hoping you get something. Sure. Well, it turned out only only one other reporter besides me signed up for pool. Wow. So I got it. Good. And um, so I was nervous because, oh, now, not, now I'm not only just taking notes for myself, but for all these other reporters that want right. copies. This was the last trial. And so I did my best. I mean, not that much happens on the first couple of days of jury selection, but I did my best to describe everything, get everything down, sent to the other reporters, and they were all real happy. And then I thought, you know what? I bet the readers of the Underground Bunker would appreciate to see that. Oh, definitely. Right? Oh, definitely. And so I just, I pumped, I put it out. And I said, hey, this, this is my pool notes. I thought you might like it. And everybody loved it. Sure. Because they can't, they can't be there. There's yeah. no cameras. Yeah. And that's when I realized, okay, that's, that's what I can bring to this. Yes. Because there's 10 other reporters sitting there, especially last trial. They're all writing very good stories. There's been some very good stories this time, too. But this, I have, you know, the, the unique thing is that I'm dashing out at the break to give you everything that just happened in court. I know. I know. And I hope for anyone listening, and I know you don't want me to say this, but I don't care. I'm going to say it anyway. If you're listening and you can... 
donate to the Tony Ortega substat.com because you know, or uh, did I say it wrong? Well, listen, sign up. I do want people, please sign up for free emails at tonyortega.substack.com. Of those people who sign up for free emails, you get all of my reports daily from the court the second I put them out. And then, yes, uh, it, it would be great if you also wanted to become a paid subscriber because we have special material just for paid subscribers. It's a lot of fun. Um, and we also have a donate button. But yeah, I'm very fortunate. I've got friends out here that have been helping me out, letting me stay, and that helps. But uh, yeah, it's expensive here in Los Angeles. Yeah, Story. I can't You're believe the prices hard. here now. I know. The prices are insane. I know. I know. I couldn't believe it. It's it's frightening. It is. I'm paying twenty dollars for a burrito. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. I can't believe it. You and I went out to dinner. And a, you and I and a friend, you had an entree and wine. The friend and I shared an entree, and sh we shared, we split a wine. And guess how much it was? How much was it? A hundred and eight dollars. Oh, a hundred. And this was not a this was not a swanky this joint. This was not a swanky joint. <laughs> That's the thing. It used to be like okay for a big fancy place, sure. Yeah, eight, five, I know no the prices are just insane. It's unbelievable. So really, if you can't donate, donate. If you, you know, <laughs> and the other thing I always tell people is everything that helps. Everything. If you can send five dollars, yeah, that, send five dollars. That's true. That's true. Because Thank honestly, it adds up and it really makes a difference. And I know you won't say it, so I'm saying it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and put it out. If you want to just make a PayPal uh, contribution, the PayPal address is Bunker Fund, Bunker Fund at TonyOrtega.org. And I, I've been publishing it on the bottom of the uh, Substack stories. But yes, thank you very much. Hey, listen, you know, Substack's been great. I, I know that some people don't love it, but it's really helped I me extend the reach of the, of the bunker and... It's so great at helping me um, with subscriptions and stuff like that. So I, I really like it. I, I hope people give it a shot and get you know get get it get used to how it works. And if people don't have a PayPal, can can they send money to you via Zelle or? I'm working those? on that. I know some people will ask me about Zelle and Venmo, and I'll I'll try to get some of those up there as well. Okay. Because like Tori says, just you know. Five bucks for a cup of coffee, I'd really appreciate yeah, it. Helps, it, makes it, it helps me out. But, helps out. But that's not why we're doing this podcast. We're doing this podcast because Tori Chrisman came to court. <laughs> it's been really, really, uh, I'm very honored to be with all of you. You know, it's, it's something. It really is. I feel awful for, I do, I feel awful for the Mastersons. I feel bad for them. Really? I really do. Yes, I do. Because I've known them personally. And, and I, as much as it's a horror show and he, you know, what he's done, I don't feel, you know, that's up to him. You know what I mean? But it's just awful to think of someone that spent the night in my house. Mm. You know, he was a friend of my son's. Mm. And to now see how far, you know, it's like, what? And you said you mess? taught him. Where was that? A Scientology yeah, school? It was, uh, yeah, it was a Scientology school in Mace Kingsley. Oh, you taught him at Mace Kingsley? Yeah, and he, he brought in a briefcase every day. A briefcase? And I'd say, Danny, at the time he was doing modeling. Right? His mom had gotten him into modeling. She's kind of his manager. I don't know if she still is, but she was then. And uh, she'd gotten him into modeling, like print ad. And uh, he was making money, a lot of money. Mm. And so I said, what are you doing with a briefcase in sixth grade? What, what's up? And he said, I'm making money. And I said, <laughs> doing what? <laughs> you know, if you're at school. What are you doing? And he said, I'm selling comic books. And I said, how much do you make in a day selling comic books? I'm thinking, you know, 50 cents, maybe a couple bucks. $100 a day. He was making $100 a day mm -hmm. at what age? Eight? Sixth grade. Sixth grade. Uh, t t uh, 11, 12 years old? I don't know. I'm bad with Jeez, how old they are. Jeez, man. Figure it out. Yeah, well, he's seeing a lot of his money go so away he, now. You know, so it, it, to see this now, it's just like, oh, my God, what a mess. But, you know, what a mess. It is. It really is. And it's and it and it does. I'm happy that the, the dark side of Scientology is being exposed. That the, every time it is, as awful as it is, it needs to be exposed because it's it is what happens. It's not like, oh, that's a really unusual case. No, it isn't. Right. I have a friend, Tommy Gorin, his wife, he was in a course room and he his twin, the person he was working with, barely knew, said 
look, can I talk to you? And he said, yeah, sure. He was a boxer. And, and uh, she said, look, I'm getting raped by the supervisor every day. And, and he said, what? Yep. And he went right to ethics, like all of us, thinking ethics will help us, right? Because that's what we're brainwashed into. <clears throat> he zoomed down to ethics, and the, you know what the ethics officer said? Don't ever say that again. Don't ever mention that to anybody, ever, ever. And, to, and Tommy, got it, his whole family was in, and her family was in. He got all of them, both families and her and him, in a motel room, locked them in, and showed them all the videos until they woke up and left. And, and, that, all and that supervisor was prosecuted and went to prison. Was he? Yeah. Good. I didn't know that. Yeah. Good. Well, see, that's once in a while they get justice, but it's slim. There's a lot of them that slip through it. Yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of abuse in Scientology that didn't, you know, someone didn't go to prison for it, that they should have. I mean, the hole in itself, the fact that Miscavige is keeping these people locked in a hole, good Lord. For... 19 years now. And I was at Flag when he came. I remember him. He is a creep guy. He, he, we had all kinds of fun stuff up. You know, we were OT7 and we were all excited. And he walked in the door. He said, get all that stuff off every door. He ripped down the map we had of all the OT7s around the world. Ripped it off the wall. Ripped off, we had a thing from, you know, from Burbank, California, Harold and Tori Bazazian. Ripped it off our door. You know, just... And I was like, I, I felt like slugging the guy right then. I well, really did. you were in his presence. Yes. Did no, you? I wasn't in his presence. I mean, he came by and did it, but I, but I, but oh. he was there. I saw him. He he was at dinner, and I a, after he'd done that, and I felt like going up to him and slugging him. I was but just, I was I just in his to know, presence. Did you get close I, enough I, to I was tower close enough, over him? I was close enough to him when he said, "Look, did the you, party's did, over." And did you tower over him? Yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> and, and, you know he's a shrimp, and, and you know so he, he. But he, but he has a presence. He does, and and unfortunately, you're in a cult like like um, Jeff Hawkins told me because Jeff Hawkins is a tall guy, and I saw him after I was out of Scientology, and I said, Jeff, how can David Miscavige beat you up? You know, and he goes, Okay, let's get a couple of things straight. First of all, we're in a cult at the time, <laughs> and you can't beat up the cult leader. Right. Secondly, even though he is a shrimp, he basically bitch slaps you. That's what he does. He doesn't really beat you up. He's got Marty and all the other guys that are there to beat you up right. if you react. Right, right. Now, I, I remember, I think it was Jefferson once who told me this great analogy because he gets asked that a lot. And he said, yeah, well, imagine you're in the Navy and the Admiral slugs you. What are you going to do? Right, what are you going to do? Right. And then uh, people sort of go, okay, I see what you're saying. But, uh, but he at Flag, I was there when he called all of us in, Miscavige, and said, look, the party's over. That's it. And we were all having a great time. We were having a lot of fun at the time. And they were putting on shows at dinner time and stuff like that. And he said, okay, the shows are done. The party's over. Everybody's going to start dressing. Because they, they, he had realized he could plug into doctors and chiropractors and money, yeah, right? Yeah. And he wasn't really into the big money yet. <laughs> there was money, but not this much money. And so he wanted everybody to dress professionally, right? right? right. He made one of the, uh, it was a class eight, Billy McCall, who had long ponytail, and he was always auditing celebrities. He made him cut his hair. Mm. And I said, you know, that's, that's stupid. You know, cele you know, musicians like guys with long hair at that time. You know, this was in the 90s, the early 90s. Well, I'm glad you came to court, Tori. Maybe next week you can come again. I don't know if you're going to be able to, to visit anymore. I think I can. I had a few appointments, so I couldn't come this the rest of this week. But um, I think I can because okay. my next... Anyway, I think I can. I hope I can. Good. Well, it's going to go for a while yet, um, um, at least a couple more weeks of testimony, and then we'll see if we can get some verdicts this time, hopefully. Oh. Um, but, Tori, thank you so much for You're joining so us on thank the you Underground the Bunker podcast. Thank you me. Thank you for, and thank you to the Underground Bunker people yes. for just supporting each other and everyone and the Jane Doe 1, 2, and 3. And it, it really makes a big difference. I know, that's the other thing that there's a lot of people that don't post, but they read. Yep. And oh. so it... 
it's the communications are very important. It's always been so many more people who are reading or lurking and not commenting. Mm-hmm. Um, but we still love our commenters over at TonyOrtega.org. Uh, but please sign up for free emails at TonyOrtega.substack.com, and you'll get uh, you'll get my reports from court just as soon as they're ready. All right, and they're Tony. good. Too. <laughs> they are. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Tony. All right, thank you, Tony. Talk to you later. Now I